I want to speak to you this morning as a friend for just a moment before we get into the message. You know, God has been so good to us as a congregation, as a church. We have seen and experienced God's blessing upon us as a congregation like very few have when you stop and you think about it. And there is much to be thankful for. And in my time of prayer and in my time of reading the Bible and whatever, I just want to really begin this morning by saying this. I want you to understand, and I know you've heard this, and I don't want you to reach up and hit that off button behind your ear, but please hear my heart this morning. I want you to understand just exactly how much God loves you. I want you to understand this morning how special you are to God. Now, I know the devil is very good about climbing up on my shoulder and your shoulder, convincing you that you're a nobody, that you're worthless, that God loves everybody else but you, that God answers prayer for everyone else but you, that, that God pours out his blessings on everyone else but you, and that God, for whatever reason, has chosen not to honor the promises of his word to you. And the devil has you convinced that even though you've come desiring God, and even though you've come desiring an encounter with the Lord, and even though you've come this morning desiring for God to do something special for you, you won't be surprised, and you won't be disappointed when you walk out of here if nothing took place. But I want to go on record this morning and tell you that the devil is a liar, and the father of all lies. He loves nothing more than to get you discouraged. He loves nothing more than to cause you to doubt. And he loves nothing more to have you come in to a place in a sitting like, setting rather like this where you really don't come expecting anything. You're just kind of complacent. And you're not really understanding that before you ever walked through those doors and before you ever pulled onto this church parking lot, you had a heavenly father that was excited, that was anxiously awaiting your arrival and was desiring to grant you the desires of your heart. Why am I thankful? I am thankful that I have a heavenly father that is a respecter of no person. I am thankful this morning that I have a heavenly father that told me to let my needs be made known to him. And when I ask in the name of Jesus that anything that I ask of the father in the name of Jesus Christ, it shall be done. So today, I want to encourage you. I want to invite you from the very outset of this message today. I want you, and it might be a stretch for some of you, it might require an effort for some of you. But I today want to encourage you from the very outset of this message, understand that God has something special for you today, has your name written on it, and just for you today, God is going to meet you right where you are. That whatever need you came into this place with today, you can leave it here at the altar at the feet of Jesus and walk out of here in victory, walk out of here in the assurance of knowing that God has your back, that God is in control, that God is working in your life and God is working on the circumstances that are weighing you down and keeping the joy of the Lord from being experienced in your life and allow that joy to erupt today and begin to praise and worship the Lord. Can you say amen? Can we just give him some praise? Can we just give him some glory today? Can we give him the honor that he's worthy to receive? His name is above every other. He is worthy. He is worthy. Today, I want you to understand that as the church of Jesus Christ in this 21st century, and God has really been speaking to me this morning about this, God is wanting to revisit his church with an outpouring of power from on high. God is desiring to do it. it it's not a matter of revisiting because I, I believe today that God wants it to be a continuous thing. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, be ye full or filled with the Spirit. 
It's a continuous thing. It's not just a one-time shot. It's not just a one-time infilling or indwelling. But I believe that if the church of Jesus Christ is going to be effective in meeting the needs that we are confronted with in this 21st century, we need extra help. I need a power that I don't possess within myself. I need the power of the Holy Spirit to indwell me, to empower me, and to enable me to go out as visible representation of Christ's love to this world and begin to make a difference. I want you to understand with me this morning that God is no respecter of persons, that he's desiring to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. That means you, that means me, that means this entire congregation. Maybe you've never desired the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and, and that's a sad thing because I really believe that the church today is complacent when it comes to the Holy Spirit. We're quick to embrace the concept of a Father, God. We're quick to embrace a Savior, Jesus Christ. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, there are a lot of things that are unknown, and the reason they're unknown is because we don't get into the Word of God and read it for ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate the truth of God's Word to us. Too many times we're dependent upon others to do the searching of the Scripture for us, we're dependent upon others to interpret it for us rather than asking God for illumination, for truth to be revealed that God said that he would do for all of us if we would take the time to spend time in his presence. And I want to encourage you this morning to understand God is wanting to do something supernatural in your life today if you'll come expecting, if you'll come desiring, if you come wanting all of God. Bow your head with me in prayer this morning as we begin, would you please? Heavenly Father, I thank you today that you're in this place. I thank you today, Lord, that you're wanting to do something wonderful among us. God, I don't think we can even begin to comprehend. So today, Holy Spirit, I ask once again, walk before me into this pulpit. Your humble servant, Lord, desires for you to anoint these lips of clay, this mind. Give us the words to say, Lord, that will prove to be encouraging that will prove to be inspirational, that will prove, oh God, to be challenging, that we will become the people of God that you've called us to be. Lord, we desire to make a difference in this day and time in which we live, and we need your help. We're needy people today, God, and we're so dependent upon you. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll work today in this place. May we be respectful, Lord, not interruptive, Lord, by getting up and moving around or by being distracted, Lord, but paying attention and having an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying. For what's accomplished, we'll be quick to give you praise, and all of God's people said, amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> I just had a note handed to me. Before we get into the message, we need to pray for Danny Shank. He was just admitted into RMH. We're believing and trusting today for a healing. I'm not sure exactly what's going on, but God knows Let's just take a moment to do that, shall we? Father, today, we pray for our friend Danny. You know exactly, Lord, what's taking place in his life. You know exactly, God, the touch that he needs from you. Your word declares to us that I am the God that healeth thee. So today, Lord, I pray that you would divinely intervene. Lord, just remove any illness, any affliction that is there. We pray that we're going to receive a report even before the service draws to a close as to how you've supernaturally intervened and how, once again, you've proven your faithfulness. For this, we'll give you praise, and all of God's people said, amen. I invite you to turn with me in God's Word to Acts chapter 1 as we begin this morning. We want to look together at verses 4 through 8. I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind standing together with me. Let's do a responsive reading. Acts chapter 1, looking at verses 4 through 8. Ask if you would please to read every other verse. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. <clears throat> Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Israel. 
but you, turn to your neighbor and say, but you shall receive power. Go ahead, keep talking to him. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me, that is Jesus, in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Do you believe that? Let it be, Lord Jesus. You may be seated. I have a concern. As a third generation Pentecostal pastor, and that is that we are facing a potential loss of a very special thing from the Lord as a denomination in the Assemblies of God. And that is the wonderful experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, Pastor, why do you say that? We're Assemblies of God. We're Pentecostal. Yes, we are. We have a rich heritage. We just celebrated a 100-year anniversary as a denomination. One of the reasons why the Assemblies of God was birthed back at the turn of the 20th century was the fact that there was a need for all the gospel to be preached. And that included the baptism in the Holy Spirit. That included the experiencing of all the gifts of the Spirit that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and then Paul elaborates further on them in chapter 13, talking about love needs to be our motive for the expression of these gifts, and then chapter 14 there in 1 Corinthians as to how they are to be exercised or used in a church service. But the thing that concerns me as a minister of the gospel and as a Pentecostal preacher is the fact of the lack of desiring the baptism in the Holy Spirit among church constituents. A lot of people who attend Assemblies of God churches give mental assent to it. If you were to ask them, do you believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit? They would tell you yes. Have you actually been in a service where there have been people baptized in the Holy Spirit? They will tell you yes. When you ask them, have you yourself experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit? They would say no. And then you say, do you desire to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Their answer would either be, I'm not sure, or no. That's what concerns me. And I'm going to tell you why. Because it's like with anything. If you don't exercise it, if you don't put it into practice, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. Come on. Are you with me? Now listen. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then you are a candidate for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And it's something that we need to desire. God laid on my heart as I was getting this message together. He just compelled me. He said, Jeff, I want you to read the book of Acts. So I read it through. And I read it through again. And I read it through again. And I read it through again. I don't remember exactly how many times I read it. I, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say at least seven or eight times this past week that I read through the book of Acts. But I was amazed. I mean, I've read this. I've preached on it. I've been in ministry for 38 years plus. I've been raised in a pastor's home. I've heard countless sermons on it and whatever. But I was amazed as I took time to just really allow it to sink in how many wonderful things happened in the church after the day of Pentecost because they were endued with power from on high. They were seeing things that they had seen Jesus do, but now just the common, ordinary people like you and like me were doing them. And I believe that God is wanting to do the same thing today. How are we going to reach our world through the endowment of power from on high, speaking of the person of the Holy Spirit as we are baptized in the Spirit by none other than the one who saved you from your sins, Jesus Christ? 
recognizing that Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the element that I am baptized into, but Jesus Christ is the person that actually does the baptizing. And we need to desire that like never before if I'm going to be the effective witness to the world in which I live today. Look, friend, people know whether they like to admit it or not, people know there is a supreme being out there. They have looked to many things that have been offered under the name of religion, but there is a lot of false cults. There are a lot of false doctrines. There are a lot of false teachings that are out there, and I've preached on that recently. You're all familiar with that, but what I'm saying to you is this. If you have the Holy Spirit residing within you, he will illuminate your mind and reveal truth if you really desire it. There's a source of Holy Ghost power from on high that too many Christians today have either overlooked or rejected. And I want to remind you this morning as your friend that the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the Holy Spirit is a gift that is for you to receive today. Regardless of what a lot of people would try to make you understand today, God has not ceased to pour out his anointing and power and he is desiring to do it in the 21st century church just as he did in the first century church. Now let's take a moment this morning and examine this great biblical truth, the mighty anointing of the Holy Spirit of the living God and learn how it equips today's church to minister to a hurting world. In Luke chapter 24, I'm not going to take time to read it, but you can look it up, mark it in your Bible, and read it later on this afternoon. In Luke 24, verses 47 through 53, we read where Jesus is giving his final instructions to his disciples before returning to his Father in heaven. Peter, James, and John, and the other disciples had just finished three and a half years of intensive daily training by none other than Jesus himself. He had been with them 24-7. He had given them on-the-job training ministry assignments and debriefed them afterwards. He had taken time to explain the word of God to them. He modeled godly behavior and effective ministry before them. No group of individuals before or since have ever received better training than the 12 that walked with Christ for three and a half years. But it's interesting as he's bringing this narrative to an end, Jesus told them, don't go out and minister yet. Stay here in Jerusalem until you have been endued with power from on high. They've been personally trained by Jesus. And yet they were still not considered ready for ministry by Jesus. Why? because they were lacking a key ingredient needed for effective ministry to take place in their lives. It would make them effective witnesses in carrying out the Great Commission. And contrary to the teaching in some churches today, water baptism and baptism in the Holy Spirit are two entirely different biblical experiences. In verse 5 of our text that we read earlier there in Acts 1, Jesus said, John, speaking of John the Baptist, baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We see here then that Jesus distinctly distinguishes between the two experiences. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, we read about the 120 in the upper room receiving the fulfillment of Jesus' promises. Their baptism of the Holy Spirit was the promised source of the power from on high that there was needed for effective ministry. And it's vitally important to note here that the immediate observable initial evidence of their Holy Spirit baptism was their speaking in tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance or gave them the ability to do so. You see, the result of their being filled with the Holy Spirit was immediate. It was astounding. And why? Because I believe as they were there in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, the 120 that were there, they were praising and worshiping God in their known language. Can I go on record and, and just challenge you today? I believe that one of the reasons that there are not more people baptized in the Holy Spirit is because we don't praise God with our known language. 
Come on now. Am I speaking the truth? If I am, say amen. I want you to understand this morning that it's important that we praise and worship God. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is worthy of our praise. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be glad and be joyful unto him. Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord at all times. His praise shall continuously be in my mouth. That's what the word of God says. But you know, one of the, one of the challenges that I have as an individual in this daily life is I allow myself to become consumed with the day-to-day -day activities, the day-to-day -day problems, the day-to-day -day situations, and I forget what a mighty God it is that I serve. But I need to remind the devil of how great God is, of how good God is, and that I will be willing to praise him even in the bad times. I know that God is there with me. And friend, I would remind you of the fact, just think how bad the bad times would be if you had to face them alone. And you didn't have God there with you who promises us in his word, he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. I would hate to think of going through life without God. How about you? He is my faithful companion. He is my faithful friend. He is my advocate in and through the person of the Holy Spirit. He is my counselor. He is my Jehovah Jireh, my provider. It's interesting that when you read the book of Acts, you find out that the formerly Christ-denying but now spirit-filled apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2 preached a bold and anointed sermon that resulted in the conversion of 3,000 souls being added to the church in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. In Acts 3, Peter and John, fresh from the mighty outpouring of Pentecost, were used of God to bring healing to a man that had been crippled from birth there at the gate beautiful of the temple, and another 2,000 were added to the Lord there in Acts 4, 4. The Spirit-baptized apostles performed many miracles, signs, and wonders in Acts 5, resulting in many more conversions to the Lord. Spirit-filled Philip preached in Samaria with miracles and healings and casting out of demons and numerous conversions there in Acts chapter 8. Peter was used by God to heal lame Ananias and two entire towns turned to the Lord in Acts 9. And later he was used of the Lord to raise Dorcas from the dead that resulted in the conversion of many individuals in her city. Friends, I'm talking about power from on high. I'm talking about a God who is alive. I'm talking about a God who's interested in getting personally involved in your life and in mine, getting involved in day-to-day -day activities and meeting people's needs where they are. That those who are discouraged, those who are ready to give up in despair, those who are ready to throw in the towel. He wants to remind them that he is alive and he is well and he is active in the lives of believers and it's time that we proclaim to the world that Jesus Christ is the truth, the life and the way and he will make a difference in the world in which we live. Come on folks, it's okay to get excited about God. Give him praise. Give the devil a black eye. When I read when I read the book of Acts, I am reminded of what an awesome and powerful God it is that we serve. When I read of Peter, when it was noised abroad that he was going to be in town and people hurried up and they went and got sick grandma, they went and got sick Johnny, they went and got sick mom, they went and got sick dad, and they laid him there along the road where Jesus, or excuse me, where Peter was walking. And when Peter would walk by, when his shadow would fall upon them, they were healed. That's power. That's God wanting to manifest himself through the lives of individuals. And friends, I'm here to tell you today, we need that. We need that. I don't need to pay for advertisement. Let me tell you something. When God starts doing those kinds of things, word of mouth is going to be the best advertisement that you could ever have. People are going to get excited. People are going to be looking for it. And, I, and hear my heart today. I don't want to just preach about it. I want to experience it. Amen? Amen. I don't want to talk about what Jesus used to do or what Peter did or what Paul did. I mean, that's great. That's wonderful. But these are given as examples to us today to come alive under the realization of what is possible and what God has equipped his church with if we will pick up the thing that God has blessed us with, and that is the person of the Holy Spirit and begin to employ it in our lives to where I am walking in the fullness of the Spirit of God. And you've heard me use this expression before, but I can't think of any better. I want to be a juicy fruit. Christian for God, that when you bump into me, I splash the fruit of the Spirit out onto you. Amen. 
Wouldn't it be nice if HFA had the reputation? I'm telling you what, that church is filled with juicy fruit Christians. Fruit of the Spirit. Juicy fruit of the Spirit Christians. I'm telling you, you go around there, those people, they're going to love you. You go around there, I'm telling you what, you might walk in there all down in the dumps and whatever, but man, that joy is contagious. You can't walk out of there without a smile on your face, a song in your heart, and a spring in your step because those people are fanatics for Jesus. You walk in there, those people are going to show you patience. Oh, you might walk in there down trodden and despair and, 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 and discouraged. You may walk in there feeling like you don't have a hope in the world. But I'm here to tell you right now, there's a peace that just comes over you. You can't help but experience because you know that God's got you in the palm of his hand and no weapon formed against you can prosper. And I could go on and on, but read about the fruit of the Spirit there for yourself. In Galatians chapter 5, I'm here to tell you today, God will supply your need, friend. Let's pick it up and put it into action. It's already there. The book of Acts shows many more instances of believers filled with the Holy Spirit, ministering God's word with power. As a result, many individuals came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and it didn't stop there. Can I also suggest another reason why I believe that there's a lacking of power in the church today? It's because the church of Jesus Christ is not walking in obedience. Oh, pastor, boy, you're really stepping on toes now. If you can't say amen, say oh me. But listen to what I'm saying. Why would I say that? Because when I read here in the Bible... And I want to go on record. I am not suggesting to you that you need to be baptized in water to be saved. There is only one thing that's going to save you from your sins. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. So I don't want to be accused of preaching heresy. But I will say this. It is a command. It is not an option. It is a command that when I receive Jesus Christ into my life, I need to be baptized in water. Jesus felt so strongly about it that he led by his example. And he said that when you lead somebody to the Lord, we need to baptize them in water so that they are giving outward testimony to what's taking place on the inside. So what I'm saying to you today is this. If you have been saved for some time and you've never been baptized in water, you need to read the word of God and see what it says. You need to walk in obedience to God's word. It's not an option. It's a command. I believe that one of the reasons that we miss out on the best of God is because we haven't done what he's told us to do. You know, so many people say, I want to know what the will of God is. We're not doing what we know is the will of God. Now, I know this is not going to get me any brownie points with a lot of you. But you know what? I'm not out after brownie points. I'm out after preaching the truth. And I want to see you grow and mature in your Christian walk with God. I want to see this church explode. God gave me a vision for this church years ago. It's beginning to happen. And yes, I'm encouraged. I'm enthused. But I don't want to be caught up in in what God is doing. You know, so much of the fact that I quit preaching the truth. Are you hearing my heart this morning? Are you with me? Before Pentecost, when Jesus had been taken prisoner in the Garden of Gethsemane, All the disciples had deserted him and fled. You can read about it there in Matthew 26. After Pentecost, the same disciples were bold witnesses for Jesus, but they were endued with power. Acts chapter 2, the first four verses, was the first and great New Testament day of Pentecost. But this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, power from on high, was never intended to stop there. The baptism in the Holy Spirit that Peter and the others received that day was in Peter's words for all believers. Read it for yourself there in Acts 2, 37 through 39. The promise of being filled and baptized in the Holy Spirit is for you, for your children, and for those who are yet afar off. In other words, for those who have yet to be born. Friend, understand Believing in simple faith is a key to receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues. In the Great Commission, Jesus said, these signs will accompany those who believe. They will speak in new tongues. There in Mark chapter 16, verse 17. And friend, it's not a mystery why those who don't believe in the biblical baptism with the Holy Spirit don't receive it. It is, said Jesus, for those who believe. This mighty Pentecostal baptism 
being for all who are afar off is consistent with the global great commission which believers understand is for the entire church age not just for the first century it did not die off with the last of the apostles but it is just as real it is just as relevant it is just as needed today as it was in the first century church Jesus said in that worldwide commission that certain signs would accompany and confirm the preaching of the gospel, including that those who believe will speak in new tongues. And this initial evidence of the Pentecostal baptism with the Spirit is part of the gospel message to be shared among all nations throughout all centuries. Some anti-Pentecostal preachers have tried to convince their listeners that the Acts 2 Pentecost was a one-time experience, never to be repeated but we have examples in the book of Acts where this experience took place in Caesarea at a Roman centurion's house by the name of Cornelius there in Acts chapter 10. And I, and, I, and I often jokingly refer to this. Can you imagine in the midst of preaching, everybody that was there in your audience began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Let it be, Lord Jesus. Let it be, Lord Jesus. I prayed for the day that there'll be such a hunger and a desire on all of your parts that as we are praising and worshiping God, whether it be in the worship service or through the preaching of the word, that the Holy Spirit will begin to fall. And those of you who have been seeking for, those of you who have been desiring the baptism in the Holy Spirit, who have been desiring Jesus Christ, the giver of that gift, the, the baptizer of that gift, you're desiring the person of the Holy Trinity, the third person of the Holy Trinity, who is God himself, that is known as the Holy Spirit. You're desiring, oh Holy Spirit, take all of me and saturate me, baptize me, pour out of me, God, with your anointing and with your spirit, that I may know what it is to be a spirit-filled believer. Walking in the power of God. Again, in Acts chapter 19, we read of the men at Ephesus where Paul went there and was talking to them, and he asked them, have you yet been baptized in the spirit? He said, we don't know of any baptism, but John, speaking of water baptism, and it says that when Paul laid his hands on them, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other tongues. By now, we see a recurring theme. When believers are baptized with the Holy Spirit, there's immediate evidence of that experience, and that is they speak in tongues. They're in Acts 2.4, Acts 10.46, and again in Acts 19.6. What then should believers do to receive this wonderful promise of the Father, this baptism, this gift of the Holy Spirit? First of all, I believe it's imperative that we get down to the very basic ABCs of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And friends, there's no set formula other than desiring this gift and the giver of the gift. And may I just go on record and say desire the giver of the gift more than the gift itself. First of all, I believe it's imperative as a born-again believer, believe that it's for you and for all, not just for a select few. Second, repent and be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, is what Peter told the crowd that was assembled there on Acts chapter 2, verse 38. He emphasized then, and I emphasize again today, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for all Christian believers. Be sure that your heart is right with God, that you've repented of your sins and you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You know what one of the things is that grieves me as a pastor? Is to know that there are people who come to church week after week after week and yet their heart is not right with God. Did you hear what I said? There are people who come to church week after week after week, but yet their heart is not right with God. Friends, hear me this morning. I don't say this to be judgmental. I say this as someone who wants to see you in heaven. Do you recognize that we're all sinners? 
Do you recognize that we all are in need of a Savior? Do you recognize the importance of confessing of your sins and putting your trust in Jesus Christ and Christ alone? Not in you, not in anything that you can do of yourself other than putting your trust in the Lord, that he was the perfect gift that was offered by God to pay the price for your sins in full. And when you call out upon the name of Jesus and ask him for forgiveness of your sins and confess that he indeed is the only begotten Son of God, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, he will be faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Write your name in the Lamb's book of life and you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Father God is your Father and you are his child. Glory to God. But that's so important. It's so imperative. Don't just think coming to church. Don't just think putting money in the offering plate or whatever else it may do, you may do rather in service to the Lord. Don't think that's going to earn you a place in heaven. It's through putting your trust in Christ alone. Remember who the source of the baptism with the Spirit is. That is Jesus Christ. In all four Gospels, Jesus is called the one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's the one. We're living in a day and a time where people are mimicking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Where people are abusing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I've actually seen where there have been individuals who have said, you come to this seminar or that seminar if you desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and we guarantee you before you leave, you'll be filled. They do what's known as coaching. Folks, that's not of God. Now listen, I'm not trying to be sacrilegious when I do this, so please know this. And I'm going to be making up some names, okay? But basically what they do is they say, repeat after me. Honda, Honda, Yamaha, Suzuki. Now those are three names of motorcycles. Okay? That's not what they do. But they might as well do that. Come on, let's be honest. Repeat after me, Chris. Honda, Honda, Yamaha, Suzuki. Praise God, brother. You've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh-uh. That's not scriptural. That's not biblical. My Bible tells me they spoke in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Not as man coaches you. Now I know there are people with good intentions. I know there are people who mean well. But listen, there's going to be a lot of people in hell that had good intentions. And it's time that you and I wake up as Pentecostal believers and recognize that the word of God is truth. And we need to do it God's way and not man's way. Amen? Look with faith to Jesus, the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. Next, hunger and thirst for this Holy Spirit, anointing of power from on high. Allow Paul's command, be filled with the Spirit that we referred to earlier there in Ephesians 5.18, be the cry of your heart. Friends, it is a gift that is yours to receive. Now, there's many ways to receive. At the first Pentecost, there in Acts 2, those who received were gathered together apparently in prayer. It was a group setting into which the Lord sovereignly poured out his spirit. Later on in Acts 10, at Cornelius' house, right in the middle of Peter's sermon, they were all baptized in the spirit. In Ephesus, they received the baptism with the Holy Spirit through the laying on of Paul's hands there in Acts 19. So we understand that the variety is obvious. You can receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit in any number of ways. Anywhere that you find yourself in an atmosphere of worship and seeking after all that the Lord has for you, you can receive. I emphasize the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for today. The Pentecostal baptism in the Holy Spirit is for today. It is for you. 
just like those that were there in Jerusalem, just like those that were at Cornelius' home, and like the believers in Ephesus, you too can be filled with this Holy Spirit of the living God, that you will be endued with power from on high, that you can go forth into your Jerusalem, you can go forth into your Judea, you can go forth into your Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the world, and believe that when you pray, asking in the name of Jesus, of the Father, that the Father will be faithful in pouring out the Spirit upon all, and you can go forward and see signs and wonders accompany the preaching of God's Word. I humbly submit to you today, you can make a difference in your workplace. You can make a difference in your community if you'll dare to put yourself in a position of availability to the Holy God. So as I close today, and as our praise team makes their way back, I implore you, Ask the Lord today for this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit. And as you are asking, expect him to fill you with his spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enables you. Understand with me this morning that God is no respecter of persons, that God will honor his word and just like the 120 that were gathered together there in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, it says as suddenly there came the sound from heaven as, as of a rushing mighty wind. Suddenly there were cloven tongues of fire that came down and sat on their head. Friends, I don't know that we're ever going to experience the sound as, as of a rushing mighty wind again. I don't know that we're ever going to experience the cloven tongues of fire again. But one thing I do know is you will experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gives utterance. That much I do know. And I want to encourage you to know that it is for today. But it is available to all who desire more of God. That's the key putting myself in a position of availability to the Lord. What voice are you going to listen to? You're going to listen to the devil? Telling you you're no good? Telling you that you're not worthy? Telling you that you don't qualify? Telling that, that you know, well, okay, God's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. I've been seeking for this pastor for years, and it hasn't happened yet, so obviously it's not for me. Listen, God's not a man that he should lie. It's either truth or it isn't. I stand before you today not to, not to boast or whatever, but I, I'm here to tell you, I, I'm, I'm no better than you are, but I have experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I know it's real. I know it's for today. I know the difference that it will make in your life. When adversity comes along, it reminds you that you can walk in a confidence and an assurance of knowing that your God is greater than anything that opposes you. It will make you aware of needs of others that you were not aware of previously. That you will find yourself praying for things that you're not even aware of. But as you are praying, God knows the need. And later on, you may or may not find out until you get to heaven, but you may find out in this lifetime that when you were praying at a certain time on a certain day, an individual will come up and say at a certain day and a certain time, this was going on. And you'll know it'll be confirmation that God was using you as an intercessor prayer. We need this in the 21st century. Can you say amen? We need the Holy Spirit in our lives to a fuller degree. Stand with me to your feet, would you, this morning, please? I want to welcome you. If you're physically able, would you just come and join me here around the altar? Come on. Just come join me around the altar for just a few moments, if you would, before we dismiss. Tonight, I'm going to be speaking on a fresh encounter. It's kind of part two of this message. And I want to encourage you that when you go home today, take some time to be in prayer for the service tonight. I also would like to invite you to come back tonight. I know that may not be part of your normal routine, but but let me encourage you. God is wanting to baptize you in the Holy Spirit God is wanting to re-baptize you in the Holy Spirit. 
God is wanting to endue you with power from on high that you can be more effective in ministering to the needs in your community, in your workplace, and the surrounding area. And God is wanting to use us as one, and I emphasize that, as one of many churches here in this valley to make a difference for God. But the church is you. The church is me. It's not a building. It's not just one or two individuals, but it's all of us collectively. If you consider HFA to be your church, you're part of this church. And it's going to be as spiritual. It's going to be as effective as what you allow God to do the work in your life and in mine. Now, we have seen wonderful things happen, and God has blessed us tremendously. He really has. But I am a firm believer that the best is yet to come. And I believe that God wants you to be a part of that. But I need his help. I need his guidance. So today, will you just take a moment, and in your own words, I mean, I'm just making suggestions to you now, because I don't, I don't look, I, I in no way, shape, or form want to tell you what to do. That's not my purpose. I will ask you, I will ask you to spend time in prayer and ask God, what role do I play? What part do I play? But oh God, more than anything, I need this endowment of power from on high. I don't understand all the ins and outs of it, God. I don't know all the things that are involved, but I do know that first of all, it's a promise from you, Heavenly Father, just like salvation. Jesus, just as you saved me from my sins, so you are the baptizer of this wonderful gift, this wonderful experience of the Spirit of God that's known as the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So if it's from God and it's of God, I know it's something that's going to benefit me and make me better. And last of all, God, I want to put myself in a position of availability to you. Don't understand it. Don't know all that it involves. But Lord, you've promised it, promised it to me. You've promised me, Lord, that it's going to make me an instrument that you can use and work through to make a difference in the world in which I live. That's the desire of my heart. So will you just take a moment? I'm going to lead us in a, in a congregational prayer, and you don't have to pray what I'm praying. I'm not saying that, but in your own words, just ask God, what is it? How is it that you desire to use me? So just right now, just go ahead in your own words. Heavenly Father, I thank you today. I praise you today, Lord. I glorify your most holy name. I thank you that you were in this place, and I thank you today, God, you are looking for individuals that you can work in and through. Today, Lord, I am so thankful that you're not a respecter of persons. You promised us in your word that you would pour out your spirit upon all flesh, and God, that's us. That's us. Collectively, individually, we are the church of Jesus Christ in the 21st century. And Lord, we desire to be an instrument that your spirit is manifested through to make a difference in the world in which we live, in our workplace, in our school, Lord, in our community, in our family. Oh, Lord, that people will see the love of Jesus in and through us. But Lord, we need that supernatural power from on high. We need that endowment that, oh, Lord, comes from making ourselves an empty vessel, emptied of self, emptied of selfish desire, and desiring more of God. So, Lord, today, as we put ourselves in a position of availability, asking, Lord, that anything that is there that is not of God, asking today, Lord, anything that would be detrimental, oh, Lord, to my spiritual walk with you, right now, God, purify with your fire from on high. Burn up the chaff, burn up the dross, burn up, Lord, anything there that is not in accordance to your will. Lord, may I walk in truth. May I walk in understanding. May I desire you more than life itself and desire to be all that you have called me to be and anointed me to be as a servant of God. Lord, I pray for my friends that are part of this church. I pray, God, that your anointing would begin to fall upon them, birth within them a desire for you. Help them to understand the difference that they can make. Give them a boldness, O oh God, and Lord, most of all, baptize them 
baptize them in the Holy Spirit that we would come alive under the realization of being able to discern God's will. Anoint us for service is my prayer. And may we walk out of here encouraged and strengthened in you. And we'll give you praise and thanksgiving, Lord. Should you tarry, bring us back again safely to your house this evening would be my prayer. May we make a difference for the kingdom of God and all of God's people said, amen. Can we just give one more praise offering to the Lord today? <laughs> Glory. Hallelujah. He is worthy. He's worthy of our praise. Worthy of our praise. Worthy of our adoration. There is no God like Jehovah. Amen? There is no God like Jehovah God. He's worthy. He's worthy of our praise and of our adoration. Praise the Lord. I want to encourage you, as I said, Tonight at 6.30, we're going to be doing part two. And I, I just, I, look, I, I don't know how else to say it other than the fact you need to be here because I really believe that God's wanting to do some supernatural things. I want to remind you that we are receiving a special offering today. As was mentioned, there is a family in need. It is a tremendous need. So I'm going to ask, if you would, to dig deep, uh, you know, if, if you can, and just give what you can. I mean, I, I know God has a way of, of taking it and blessing it and honoring it. We're going to have ushers at the doors to receive this special offering. We'll make sure that in its entirety, it goes to this family to help with the need. But you know what? We're family. And uh, I can promise you that if my flesh and blood is in need, I'm going to do everything within my power to help them. I believe that I need to do the same as a Christian brother. And those of you that are ladies here as a Christian sister. So whatever you can do, just do it for the glory of God. And know that you are being a blessing to someone in need. The day may be that you might find yourself in the same position. I pray not, but it might very well be that. And uh, again, I can't thank you enough for the way that you've been so faithful. And uh, you know, just helping us to minister to people in the need uh, in, the, in the past. And I believe this is going to be one more time where we're going to see this need met through the faithfulness of God's people. Amen. Board members, I need to meet with you briefly in my office uh, following the service this morning. So our praise team is going to close this out with a uh, song today. Following that, you may consider yourself to be dismissed. God bless you. So good to have you here. Let's give praise to the Lord one more time, shall we? Amen.